they love Portland when I was out there. It was very cool. It was a very progressive city. Uh, the reason why I know Portland is a very progressive city uh, is because everyone there told me. Uh, <laughs> What's up, yo? Welcome to the Young Legends Podcast, where we teach you the cheat codes of the game of life. I'm your host, Caption, a.k.a. Caption Red. I hope you're doing well wherever you are. And I'm really excited to bring you today's interview, which is my conversation with stand-up comedian David Perdue. David Perdue is a stand-up comedian who has appeared on Kevin Hart Presents Heart of the City on Comedy Central and Uproarious on Fuse. He has also acted in Love Is on the Oprah Winfrey Network and Bobcat Goldweights, Misfits and Monsters on True TV. David also co-hosts the hilarious sports comedy podcast, 4th and 10. David, so happy to have you on the podcast today. How are you doing, man? I'm, I'm good, man. Happy to be on here, man. It's, uh, it's exciting to be able to share a little time with a, a comedy buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, I've Watch you do your thing for uh, a good long time. I actually remember the first time I saw you perform. Um, oh. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> you, you did a little. You did a set at Centerform. The it was like a co-working space. Oh uh, wow! But uh, yeah, you you had a. I mean, I was laughing my butt off uh, that day uh, that <laughs> night, and uh, you had a joke about uh, a girl that was at Checkers who had a Chick Fil A voice. <laughs> the classic checkers but yeah no i i don't i'm trying to remember that show but i definitely remember that joke that yeah. joke that joke got me free chick-fil-a one time at a show <laughs> there you go. Afterwards and was like, i love that so much and they had one of those free biscuit uh cards or whatever and i was like i'm gonna do this joke until i don't do that get that no more <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah you should uh yeah. you should make no sure joke that you paid me that much <laughs> <laughs> that's at awesome that man point, yeah that's great. That's great. Well, cool. Well, uh, the way that I like to start my um, interviews off is uh, I like to ask my guests to share just a, a fun story, uh, a cool story, uh, you know, whatever story you want to do just to kick it off. You know, everybody likes a good story. So uh, what you got for us today? So I'd be remiss if I didn't share this, the probably the, the cool story I might ever have. Uh, it happened in 2018. Uh, I was blessed enough to be a part of a television show on Oprah Winfrey's network called Love Is. And um, um, we I flew out to L.A. to go to the red carpet premiere, even though technically I wasn't like for real, for real invited. Like I was on several episodes, sure. but they were trying to do like main cast, main cast, you know, what they were like, all right, sure, you can come out. And I, I went out there just wanted to, you know, hang with my friends who I was on the cast with or whatever. And um, I remember maybe probably 10, 12 years before that, I saw Oprah on television and she was referencing this guy who I was learning about in college. And I said, I feel like she, she didn't even reference. Him. I was like, I feel like she knows who this person is. And I remember turning to my mom and I was like, when I meet Oprah one day, I'm going to talk to her about this book. <laughs> right. Mm. Just like real prophetic, like, right. Sure. And 10 years later, I get on a show on her network. I'm like, maybe she'll come to set. She doesn't come to set. Anytime I'm on there, everybody has rumors like maybe she'll be on set. Never happened, right? So I was like, well, I want to go to L.A. and do some comedy anyway. Can I go and, you know, be a part of this red carpet? So we go. I'm on the red carpet and Oprah pops up on the red carpet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what you do when you see Oprah, but I uh, yell curse words and freak out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so Oprah, but she walks by me and it's very clear that, like, I'm not supposed to talk to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but based on... uh the the, the uh, bodyguards <laughs> that mm -hmm, she had sure. the people so she walks on the red carpet she's standing in the middle of the red carpet i get the chance to walk on the red carpet uh there are some pictures out there i make very weird faces when people tell me to smile but that is what it is and then they mm. they tell me to keep moving as oprah's in front of me and there's a weird youtube video out there somewhere where no one knows it but me but i walk by oprah but i pause just a little bit to see what Oprah smells like, because who doesn't want to know <laughs> what a billion dollars smells like? So I walk, sure. and then there's a guy that yells, like, keep it moving. So uh -huh. keep it moving. Oprah comes. We watch the first episode. Again, no communication with Oprah. They're like, all right, after party on the roof. And so Oprah leaves before then. So I was like, well, I guess I'll never get to meet Oprah. We go on the roof, 
And lo and behold, I see people swarming because Oprah did not leave. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so me and some other castmates, we like, oh, we got to meet Oprah. But I'm up there. I don't have a, I don't have representation. Like I, I had no manager agent. I still don't have any of that, right? Mm-hmm. So there, other people's manager agent and stuff was like getting them to meet Oprah. Like, hi, Oprah, this is my client, da da da, whatever, whatever. I had to just make it happen. <laughs> Sure. So like I just kind of like wiggle my way around, and I like I remember this. I thought I was getting close, and there was this dude who like had to have worked for some sort of like military because his arm was so strong. And he like <laughs> hit me in the shoulder and was like, "Where you going?" And I was like, "Oh, nah, I'm on the show. I'm just trying to, you know, say hello or whatever, right?" And so uh, my friends kind of see me there because they're already talking to her, and she sees me, and I'm like, "Hi, over from David Perdue." And she's like, "I know who you are," mm. and that made me uh, melt a little bit. I was like, well, I could die now. Like, oh, <laughs> sure. well, you're, you're David Perdue. She's like, you're, and she said, you're nothing like that senator. And I was oh like, well, God, you really know who I am? <laughs> and uh, I, but at that moment, I remember what I told my mom years before, and I asked her if she knew who, if she knew who Howard Thurman was. That's the mm-hmm. guy who I knew. Yeah. And Howard Thurman um, is, if you, people who don't know, was like a mentor to a lot of people in the civil rights movement. Right, like this, uh, he's a big theologian, right. mystic, all this other stuff. So I was like, "Do you know how Thurman is?" And I saw Oprah's eyes light up because nice. you can tell not a lot of people talk to her about that. And she right. said, "Of course." And I was like, "Which one is your favorite book?" Right? Mm. And she kind of like paused, like she didn't really say anything. And I said, "Can I guess?" And she said, mm. "Sure." And then I guessed her favorite book of his, and then her eyes lit up even more. And. <laughs> conversation about you know his work or whatever and then i got to take a picture with oprah after that after we talked about one of her favorite authors and i talked about doing it to my mom probably over 10 years before that and then maybe 30 minutes after that oprah i did a tequila shot with oprah and that was the greatest moment of my life (laughs) oh my gosh yeah oh wow yeah oh wow tequila apparently yeah apparently man she's got a she's got a good taste in uh a many oh, things. The, the good stuff too, bro. I promise you, I've never uh, had I'm sure. anything like that before. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh man, that's amazing. I I saw the picture online of you and Oprah, and I just thought it was like, hey, let me just get a quick snap with Oprah. You know how it is with celebrities, right. man. Take the photo, keep it moving. Um, now we got yeah. to talk about what I, I like. It sounds weird, but like. Almost like I called it prophesied or whatever mm-hmm. over 10 years before that to my mom. I remember texting my mom and dad at like it had to have been two o'clock in the morning this time because I was on the West Coast. But mm-hmm. I remember yeah. texting them like it happened. I did it. And they were just, yeah, bro, I was real proud of me because I, I, they knew that that was a thing that I had said way before I even thought I was going to get into comedy or anything, you know. So, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. That's, that is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, uh, prophesy um a number of things right now for myself so that yeah, i do that <laughs> look man just power in the tongue as they say yeah, <laughs> indeed indeed yeah. very cool well um you know i'm really excited to have you on like i said um you know oprah uh has good taste in comedy as well because you definitely have some chops uh <laughs> and skills i was actually watching well you you still have your blog up on your facebook so so there's wow. that um, okay. And I, I read through it and it was uh, it was good, inspiring stuff because you were saying a lot of uh, just it, it's it sounded like someone who should definitely pursue comedy, even if your blog post was 10 years ago. Wow. And then I watched the video and I was like, ah, I was hoping he'd be a little worse <laughs> when he first started. <laughs> uh, uh, but you got some chops. But uh when you and Damon, uh, you know, I've had Damon on the uh, podcast. Homie oh, Damon Sumner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good peoples. When you and Damon did that, what is it, uh, high school reunion together. Yeah, it was um, my uncle's high school reunion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, that, was that also your first time going up or? No, no, no. We'd, we'd gone, we'd been performing for maybe, it couldn't have been over two years, right? So, but it, okay. we weren't, right. we weren't good. And we right. definitely had not performed in front of that crowd, that type of crowd. No. So it wasn't our first time, no. Okay, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Well, I'm glad that y'all took the L and persevered. Cause <laughs> Ooh, I don't know how we made it because that that was demoralizing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nothing like a crowd. Of, see, David has that part of the story, but my part of the story is 
me being so bad and watching someone want to boo me and like, but then watching my aunt get about to fight the lady that doesn't know that that's, <laughs> you know, her nephew up there. And I had to just put the microphone in and like rush off. So there wasn't a fight between my aunt and some angry person who was rightfully angry at me being terrible at her reunion, you know, like, sure. Yeah. It yeah, was yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she could have uh, shaved her keys at you, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> Listen, that would have been that. That really would have got my aunt fighting. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it, I have good family, thankfully. You know, <laughs> they would get my back. Yeah. But they they deserve to boo me and key me though. I was not good. <laughs> it's very terrible. Very cool. Well, um, you know, we all had those nights, so it's all good. You know. Um, and speaking of which, so you've been doing some pretty big things in the past. I would say what about four. Or five years, roughly, um, something along those lines. Yeah, stuff's been opening up a little bit for me. Yeah, in the last four or five years. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about the journey up until that. You know, because everybody starts seeing you on TV and they start seeing you on different Oprah shows and and whatnot. Right. Um, and uh, you know, they don't see the journey. So can you just talk a little bit about that journey that um, you know is behind the scenes? Uh, nobody sees and is from everybody everyone I've spoken to you know kind of difficult yeah I mean I, I definitely didn't ever think anything that's come my way in the last few years was gonna come my way when I started uh, I didn't even know if I'd be good and I didn't even come into comedy with like this like dream of being a comedian as a kid like that wasn't even a right. thing that I ever imagined for myself like my whole family thought I was going to be a preacher <laughs> when I was in college. All my friends were preachers. I, you know, I thought maybe I could study like I was going to education or something like that. Like I, I didn't have, you know, those like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be on Saturday Night Live thing, nothing like that. But um, mm -hmm. when I started comedy, it really, and I feel like a lot of comedians kind of start this. You start in like a, you know, I've never met a comedian started in a great place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in life yeah. like rarely do you see comedians like my life is going perfect and now i want to share it with the world like right. <laughs> you, know, right. you know what i mean so like i remember i started my my last year in school and i was i mean truth be told i was like having a really rough time like mentally and mm -hmm. uh i had to i had to go to the school the college of uh, psychologists to make sure i was cleared to go and work one of these summer programs that i had been doing Cause I had some people who weren't sure if I was like fit to do it. And while I was in, you know, talking to the, the, the psychologist or whatever, I was making them laugh. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, he shouldn't be laughing right now. <laughs> like, right, right. but also, but not in a bad way. I was like, I, I must be good at making people laugh cause he's mm -hmm. getting paid to not laugh. And here he is chuckling a little bit. Right. Sure. So coupled that with like a friend of mine who, uh, his brother was doing comedy and he started talking and he was just like, you should do comedy. And I was like, oh, I'm thinking about it. I had never thought about it in my life. Mm -hmm. But once I said that, it kind of like, it was like a dare almost. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's how I started. And then, you know, the first few years, it's not, it's, it's not glamorous. Like it makes no sense. I don't know why people keep showing up. You got to be out of your mind to yeah. keep doing comedy. <laughs> and that's clearly what I was. I made no, you weren't making any money. You're staying out late. You're bombing. And even if you don't feel like you're bombing, you're you're not good. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? But the best thing you can be is persistent. Because right. if you're persistent, you'll figure it out if you're if you're diligent, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I I you know, I stayed up all the time. I was writing jokes. I was trying to perform new jokes all the time. I was just like I just fell into the comedy world. And uh, you know, after four or five years, people started it really has like three, four years. People started putting me on shows and kind of giving me opportunities to do things. But yeah, man, it's it's not it's not roses. Like even now, like ten, I'm ten years in now. It's mm -hmm. not roses, but you just I'd love to do it. You know, right. I love to communicate. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you as you sit here and say, I'm glad you said it's not. It's still not all roses because oftentimes a lot of people they see your name in bright lights, right? Mm -hmm. And they have this. Uh, misperception of our uh, misconception of of what it's like so how is comedy different than what you thought it would be like when you first got started especially as you were like oh well once i become successful if i do then this yeah i mean i guess it's different in my my expectations are different right 
Like when I started, I had, <laughs> I don't know if I had grand expectations, but I just didn't know what to expect. And so I was chasing a thing that I didn't know what it was, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start getting better and those things that you chase can be a little bit more defined. You're like, oh, I want to be on that show. I want to be on that, you know, not even like TV show, just like I want to be on this, you know, weekly show. I want to do this stuff. And then after you get those things, you realize like, oh, it's always a ladder up. You know, mm -hmm. you start hanging around headliners who are like you grew up idolizing and you realize, that, oh, they're also always chasing the next thing. Right. And so it hit me that it's like, oh, I don't need to be chasing the next thing. I'll never be happy. I can only chase like like how good I feel like I can do. Like, am I getting the most out of what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. So really nothing's only thing's changed is my expectation. Like now I don't expect to be on a late night show. I don't expect I know I'm good enough. I'm learning to be good enough to be able to do that. But I don't think I'm like I should get this or I should get that. It's just like, no, all I can do control is what I, you know, the work I put in. And so really over time, it's just like just kind of peeping game. My expectations have changed, I think, the most more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you because I've I've talked to, you know, a number of comedians about this, but it's still and just people who are in the spotlight. Like, how do you stay out of that comparison trap? And I'm going to go ahead and say something like I looked at someone on social media just the other day and I was like, oh, look at them. and you know, I had to check myself, but, mm. but that's a real thing because, you know, people that you have shared the stage with have done things and you've done things. And so, you know, it's, it's, how do you, how do you stay away from that? The comparison, right? Yeah. The, the comparison and, and that whole, oh, look at them. They're doing this. And, you know, I know that you said that you don't have expectations, but no, I, I mean, I, 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 let me, let me clarify that. I like, what I ex I've always have what I expect out of myself is to be very good at what I do, mm -hmm. and I know if I'm that, then everything else will take care of itself. And mm -hmm. so, and I, instead of limiting what I want, which is like, oh, I want this show, I want this, I'm like, let my let my gifts make room for me, you know. Instead yes. of being like, let me pick a thing that I want and focus on that until I'm upset that I don't get it. It's like just let my uh, gifts continue to make room for me, and by sharpening my gifts constantly, like that'll happen. So like. I don't I don't even not compare myself, but I it's like almost like that. What's that um, improv rule? Like, yes. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so like I'll compare and then I'll say, and I'm also good. And, yes. it's, and neither one of those things, those things can both exist. I think that's helped me. That's I just tried to honestly, I try to simplify a lot. Like I literally had a moment probably like 2016, 2015, where I kind of said, like, yeah, I, if I do these three things. I really won't care where things go with this because I feel I, I will feel good about where things go. And I was like, if I if I love myself, if I love the people around me and I love God, like I can live with whatever. Right. right. <laughs> like Absolutely. I can live with whatever. And it just took a lot of pressure that every comedian, everybody in the creative field has. It took a, it took it doesn't mean I don't have it. Let me be very clear. I still get it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a constant thing. But it just helped me focus on like what's important. And that's like me getting the most out of the gifts that I was given. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great perspective to have. And um, regarding that gift, what does that look like for you? And every comedian is different, but like, what does that look like for you getting the most out of your gifts? Because, you know, it's, th this isn't easy work, <laughs> right? It looks easy. People, people are great. Make things look easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not easy. So what does that look like for you? Um, man, this is, it's so funny because you're talking about how you had Damon on here, and I'm pretty, and I, and I feel like you asked him. He was talking about how like how he writes every day, and he does this thing where he's like he's very meticulous, and that is exactly who he is, mm -hmm. and he knows I'm the exact opposite of all of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like one of the most interesting things, like when we started, we both I remember reading the famed comedy bible. Okay. And we were like, we're going to learn how to do comedy together. And I remember when we first started, like, do you remember those old highlight books, the highlight magazines? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the cartoon was like Goofus and Gallant? I were like, it was like, it was like Gallant uh, cleans his room. Goofus doesn't clean his room, you know? Right, right, right. Like okay. I was Goofus and Damon is Gallant. Like he <laughs> was so structured. He'd write every day. He'd do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would just be like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to make it up, <laughs> you know? Okay. And early on, he was he had way more success than me early on because he knew 
the fundamentals of comedy. And for me, I just realized from that from early on, like I'm only really way it's gonna really work for me is if I learn to trust who I am. Right? Yeah. Like learn how to kind of build my own path. Now it doesn't mean I don't work. It doesn't mean I don't like, you know, write or come up with ideas or whatever, but I definitely lean heavily on what feels comfortable. And right. you do that by really exploring. Like I do a lot of introspective work. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a lot more to do, but like, I like to know why I feel about a thing. I ask the question why a lot. And mm -hmm. I feel like that helps me connect with audiences. So while I'm not like the greatest with the pen, I feel like what I, what I am is, you know, fairly thoughtful. And right. I think that allows me access and, you know, learning how to use that comedy muscle is like you pair those two things together. And I feel like as long as I continue to sharpen that, like that's the process that I have. It's like I'll ask myself, what do I really feel about this? Right. You know, instead of writing it down, because when I write it down, I kind of lose it, you know. So when you when you come up with that, how do you put all that to memory? Because, you, you know, I, I'm sure you've forgotten a joke or two that you came all up the time. with. Which Okay, so so how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Because you might come up with some absolute gold, like you know, yeah, you know, that 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 that's your uh, what what is what's the thing? Oh, your knockout punch in a set. So how do you make sure you don't lose those? So if you mean how I make sure, I well, so all right, it's gonna sound weird. If I forget it in my head, I was never supposed to have it. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> right, but it also gives me this mindset of like. There are plenty of jokes, David. So, like, if you forget that one, you'll think of another one. Now, on stage, the help what helps me remember stuff is constantly performing and recording every set. And right. then on my drive home, I listen mm -hmm. to it and like mm -hmm. I'm self editing, right? Like I'm figuring out because like, right. even when I was in college, like a lot of my friends, I was a I was a pretty decent, I was a pretty good writer, but I never once wrote like I would get A's and B's and all my writing stuff, but I never did a rough draft for any paper in college. Mm. <laughs> like never did a yeah. rough. Draft. Uh, because and, and I would always do all my papers like last minute and people mm -hmm. like, how are you doing that? But my brain, I would obsess over the topic. Right. So in, in my head, I'm editing things mm -hmm. before I even mm -hmm. put them down. Sure. And so it's kind of like that on stage. Like I'm, I'm, I'll obsess about a topic that I want to talk about on stage. And mm -hmm. by the time I've got to my third or fourth mic, like I've talked about it four different right. times and I've edited mm -hmm. it down four different ways. Sure. And it's just something that like the pen to the paper for every it's like loses his magic to me when I do that. So yeah. I've yeah. I've learned and then also to be real honest, when I first started, I definitely was writing everything down, but my car got broken into like two, three times, and each time they took my notebook and oh, I no. was like, Well, no, nah, I'm about to just buy the Jay Z little Wayne this thing. I'm about to just remember everything off the top <laughs> of my head. <laughs> they can't yes. steal that from me, you know. Yeah, actually I was as you were talking this whole time, I was thinking about the rappers who literally uh, write they freestyle or or they you know make the rhymes up in their head as they're recording and whatnot yeah. and uh that's awesome man well i mean you know there's many different ways to do it and as long as it works for you that's all that matters right yeah i'm just comfortable with it you know i don't i wouldn't suggest it for everybody i think everybody has to learn what it is that they do well and really work at that you know what i mean like when you say work harder or not or work smarter or not harder like for me that's my smarter work you know, because it's like sharpening a tool that's really helpful for me when I'm on stage. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have the recording, so it's not like you're not technically writing things. Uh, technically, you are writing things down, I guess. True, right? true, yeah. true, true. You know, but uh, yeah. yeah, it just keep, it keeps me loose too. Like if I forget something, I have it's like fight or flight will happen, and that also like sharpens, you know, the the mind and the the comedic muscle because you're like, oh, I, I don't know, remember what it is. Like, well, go to work. You're still on stage. You still have to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. cool. Is there any, um, as you have been doing uh, open mics for you know, forever, forever, <laughs> <laughs> you're still doing them? Yeah. Um, you know, you never, you never stop doing open mics. Is there any like life lesson that you learned as you uh, have been just going up and you know, you you talked about perseverance and being yourself, um, but what what life lesson do you think you know you, you learned it and you're like man people should really know this and you talk to your young <laughs> relatives about it and whatnot yeah, yeah i will say i'll say i learned i learned a lot of lessons from other people mm. right that's one of yes. the things 
one of the things that I that has helped me a lot is I've been blessed to be around some a lot of very talented creative people. Mm-hmm. And when I first started comedy, a non comedian helped me figure out what I need to do in comedy. Mm. Uh, wow. a, fr- a friend of mine who's a he's like a he is a rapper video uh, producer. I don't think he's a, I mean a producer. He's a rapper, um, public speaker. Uh, director, and as of yesterday, he's an author. He's a Christian rapper named Show Baraka, right? Right, right, right. And you know, who Show is. Yeah, yeah. He was. I think he was at the show when you performed. Oh wow! At Center form. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So good friend of mine, and at the time he was heavy into uh, Christian hip hop, and the advice he gave me was, whatever you do in comedy, don't do Christian comedy. Mm. And I thought that was so odd. And I was like, why would a Christian rapper tell me I do Christian comedy? And what he said was, he was like, if you do Christian comedy, you start with a box that you have to get out of. Right. And he was like, you can be a Christian and do comedy. Mm-hmm. But if you start with the limitation in a box, you'll begin to believe that box more than you believe in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And for me, that tapped into a thing that I'd already was, would develop later, which is like, believe in me. Mm-hmm. Right? Believe in me more than all the other things around like believe in like believe in what i'm what i've done and then what i will be able to do mm-hmm. you know and that's that is so man especially for like young people like to just like know that like mistakes are fine comedy the greatest lesson comedy taught me is like failure is a part of everything oh yeah like <laughs> you don't embrace the failing part like you have no don't get into it this is failure sure <laughs> this is a game of failure but it's like what you do with the failure. So I think, yeah, the probably the greatest lesson is like really believe in me and believe that I'm going to make mistakes, but just know that like that's part of the process. Yeah. And just love that part of the process. Like don't yeah. let it get you down. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I like that. And uh, one of my, I have a lot of favorite quotes, but one of my favorite quotes is uh, sometimes I win and sometimes I learn. Mm-hmm. And that feels like... <laughs> Everything I do, and and even you know, I imagine with your the podcast you Damon and uh, Nathan do, and um, and Dan the podcast that y'all do, I imagine afterwards y'all probably are like, oh, <laughs> that went well, but also this, this, and this, right? I mean, I'm I'm sure there's always a conversation afterwards, a, right? A little bit, but honestly, we just we the, the great thing with that, and I think it applies to comedy and what you're asking here is like we just keep showing up. Yeah, we, you know what I mean. We keep showing up, and then like we, I don't think we worry about the problems as much as like, are we enjoying what we're doing? Because mm. I always say this about when I talk to young comics who are like nervous about a set and are nervous about getting the right words, and I was like, bro, you gotta have fun. I said yes. one thing I've never seen is somebody bombing who's having a good time on stage. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like the mm-hmm. audiences can sense like if you're having a good time, they're gonna have a good time. Yeah. If you're in your head, there's a good chance they're going to be in their head. Yeah. You know, so like you and uh, I remember a, a comic, an OG comic in Atlanta, Vanessa Fraction, told me one time she was like, "Always be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Mm. Like you set the temperature. Yes. You know, like you set the temperature. And so like little advice like that was always crucial. But I, I really, I really, if anything, take away, man, I really believe in the idea of like believing in yourself. Not being cocky, not being, you know, overly confident, but like just knowing like things will be OK. You know what I mean? Like you're mm-hmm. still going to mm-hmm. be able to get up in the morning. You know sure. what I mean? And whatever creative there is, all these things are still possible for you. But you got to just get up and believe in yourself. Yeah, that's great. And uh, what do you do the days that you don't <laughs> or you can't believe in yourself? Right. Because it's not always a True. one big confidence train. Right. Sometimes that train has a. Uh, you know, a, a breakdown or something along those lines. Yeah, what do you do during those times? Oh, um, man. I like, again, I like to ask why. So I'll ask why I don't believe in myself. <laughs> mm. You know, like, I don't run from those painful things because, like, usually those things are teaching you something. You know what I mean? When you're not feeling mm. yourself, it's like, I could just be like, I don't feel myself. And then that's where it ends. Or you could say, well, let me figure out why I don't. What's the cause? How mm. did I get here? And a sure. lot of times it'll it usually from something that's out of your control that you you really don't have any business like staying in. You know what I mean? And that mm-hmm. you've seen in the past will pass. 
Right. You know, and so like those things, like, and it's a process. I'm, I'm definitely not trying to be this like 100% positivity all the time. Like, I understand that pe- we are human beings and we go through a wide range of emotions. But I, I, I love to tell myself and anybody who's struggling, is like, who's done well, that like you, if you've gotten to a point where you're doing anything, right? At some, at some point, everybody has some sort of track record of success, mm-hmm. right? As a human being, you've done something successful, even if it's just yeah. survive, mm-hmm. right? Like I always go back to my wins to help me when I'm feeling like I'm going through my losses, right? Because my wins remind me that oh, you can do this. You know, mm-hmm. and then they also sometimes remind you that you you get better at this. Like there's potential for growth. Like I used to do this thing where I would watch my first stand up set every like once a month. Mm. <laughs> I would watch it once a month. Like and like I hadn't done it in, in a while, but like five, six, seven years in, I would watch it. And at first it would just be like me studying, right? My first year in it was just me studying. But over time it would just be re- me reminding myself that I used to do I used to think that was good. And now mm-hmm. I don't, mm-hmm. which means that I got better. <laughs> sure. You know, and like that guy stuck with it and look at him now. And like I'm 10 years from now, I'm going to look at stuff I do now and be like, man, that guy thought that was good. Look how much better he is. Right. And so like and I thought that was a win. Mm-hmm. And so it's like those wins are going to remind you that there's more wins to come. But there's also some growth that's going to come and that that, you know, that's a part of life. I like it, man. I like it. That's uh. Yeah, you're gonna force me to go back and watch some old footage of myself. Oh now. man, it's <laughs> torturous, but it is it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, you know, I love um all the stuff that you do as far as you know your comedy and your you know just being active socially and uh, the podcast that y'all the four of y'all put out. You know, when I watch y'all's podcast, y'all look like you're having you know such a good time. And uh, like you said, with that being said, how important are the relationships of friends who do comedy in your growth? Obviously, people aren't going to write your jokes for you, of right. course, right? But you, uh, y'all, you and Damon have been on a journey uh, kind of together. Um, like, how important is that to surround yourself with people who uh, are on the same path as you? It's honestly more important than anything you do and that's in any walk of life like you 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 are your community right and mm-hmm. like we are all in you know, like are wired to seek out community you know like that's who we are as human beings so knowing that it's like well let me make sure i'm in tune with what i need to be in tune with so that i'm seeking out the right people and thankfully like i've been blessed to be around some amazing people whether it's Damon, whether it's Nate, whether it's Dan, whether it's like different comedians that like have given me opportunities. And it's has everything to do with like making my grandma, as my grandma would, would say, uh, like not doing anything that uh, people don't want to invite you back for. Right. You know, mm-hmm. like just keeping my keeping my nose clean, keeping my head down, working hard. But like showing people that like I actually care about human beings mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm not here to just like, you know, because, there's you know, this business, there's people who see everybody as an opportunity mm, and yeah and, you know i'll i'll regularly tell some of my friends who are doing great things that like i don't care about the stuff you're doing as much as like who you are and how you feel you know like right. that ain't gonna do nothing for me you know if i it, it just it just doesn't you know like it doesn't mean as much so yeah those those relationships are everything man because like if all of this goes like we've seen it in this past in the, during the pandemic when everything goes like, like who do you really have Right. You know, in your community, like who's who's there for you, who's lifting you up. And like that means way more to me than like, you know, rolling with somebody who's like popular or whatever, whatever it is. You know, it's like, who cares about you? Mm-hmm. You know, who do you care about? Those things are the most important. Right. Absolutely. And, and as we talk about, you know, uh, friendships and community, what do you look for in a friend to choose your friends? Because, I mean, there's seven point eight billion people on the planet right um yeah a bunch of them live in atlanta apparently according to traffic (laughs) so how do you decide like that's the kind of person i want to be friends with and what what's your i guess i don't want to use the word criteria (laughs) because yeah (laughs) it sounds like i'm putting in like some sort of algorithm to like friendship algorithm like yeah, yeah no 
Man, honestly, I, I will say this: the the common quality in all of my friends is they all have something that I aspire to be like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like every one of my friends who I consider like my friends, they have qualities that I'm like I just I'm a fan of them. Like I'm a fan of mm-hmm. a certain quality about I could name all of my friends like the quality that I'm a fan of. Like if I'm if I'm not a fan of a, a any quality, we're probably not friends. We might be acquaintances or whatever, but or I just don't know you. But like the people who are my close circle, I'm like, oh, I really admire your character. I really admire how you care about people. I really admire, you know what I mean? Like how you treat how you treat other people, how who when no one's looking. I admire how you, you know, how diligent you are. I admire how you work really hard to be, you know, good at your craft. Like I those things kind of draw me to people. And I hope that I give those things to some of my friends. Like I don't, I don't want to be this leech that's just like, well, how are you inspiring yeah. me? You know, like. <laughs> My yeah. goal is like hopefully like I'm being able to inspire in some way my friends as well. I think that's how you know the old people say like iron sharpening iron, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like if I don't feel like I can sharpen you or you can sharpen me, like it might not work. It, yeah. it just might not work. So it's just like I always look for that. I guess that iron quality in my friends. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. You know, I want to be around people who really you know uh, first off care for me. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, I look at them and I'm like, you know, you are, you're, you're something special in a way that, you know, you're, you're yeah. doing your best, being your best. You're, you're, you're just good people, you know? Yeah. Also too, it's like, you, especially as I got older, I started realizing like, you know, we're, we're all like little puzzle pieces. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so like some of my friends, like it's very clear that the puzzle piece that I am to them and they are to me. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's like it's like that's why connections and community is so important, because you can you begin to see yourself not as this individual walking through life, just trying to figure it out. But you're like, oh, no, like my friend who I've known for this amount of time, this is their puzzle piece to me and I'm their puzzle piece to them. Mm-hmm. And you see that you see the bigger picture. So you're just like, oh, we really are all connected, yep. you know, and it's like, what's my place? How have I been molded to be, you know, connected to these people's lives? And so I just yeah, I um. I just really feel like, you know, understanding that I'm a part of other people really helps uh, yeah. in figuring all this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Very cool. And uh, y'all, the four of y'all, you know, make a pretty good puzzle. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, a, yeah, I'm a big fan of the podcast. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we uh, I'm the NBA guy, if anything. And then uh, some. Yo, other- we try to get. All I'm not gonna say we try to get all sports and we definitely don't try to get I think we try to get hockey in one time and we talked to somebody about <laughs> hockey and then and we, we we had a person who really enjoys hockey and we could not stop bragging on hockey and that person got mad at us and we were like we shouldn't be doing that that's not cool <laughs> like so yeah, yeah. we were like all right well let's just only talk about stuff we know a little bit about otherwise we just come off as jerks you know yeah yeah, yeah I'm a, I'm an NBA and, and MLB guy too that's awesome man yeah. that's awesome. So, you know, you talked earlier about what you thought you would be when you were gr- uh, when you uh, grew up and when you were younger, you probably I imagine you knew a lot less than you do right now. Um, <laughs> as we say that, what is uh, a piece of advice that you would uh, give your younger self that you really wish you could just be like, hey, young David, listen here <laughs> and. All right, I'm I'm gonna give advice that was given to me, or not necessarily to me, but through somebody who knew me, right? But it's it's mm-hmm. the most the best. I tell all young people because I wish I would have heard it when I was younger, and it's from the former mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young, mm-hmm. and he was at the time. This was years ago. At the time, he was a mentor. I think the rapper T I had went to jail or something, and mm-hmm. Andrew Young stepped up to like be his mentor. And what wow. he told him, he told him the story of Jesus, right? And Andrew Young referenced how if you look in the Bible, uh, you hear about Jesus being born, right? Then you hear about him in the temple at 13, mm-hmm. you know? And then you don't hear about him again until he's 30. Right. There's no reference of Jesus between 13 and 30. Mm-hmm. And Andrew Young called those the Jesus years. He's like, that's the time you're supposed to prepare for your ministry. You go out. You're going to fall on your face. You're going to figure things out. You're trying to figure out what it is that your purpose is. And Mm -hmm. so one of the things that I would have told young me is like, understand that you're in your Jesus years 
And that means that like you don't have to have all the answers. The last thing you want is all the answers. Mm. Like being young and having all the answers is pitiful because that means what's there to live for. You know what I mean? Like what is there mm-hmm. to grow? What is there to learn from life? So embrace the idea that you don't have all the answers. Be curious, be concerned, but like understand that like you you're not gonna have it all. And that's exactly what you're supposed to be, is not together. <laughs> And kind of just walk in this like curiosity and looking for open doors and look for opportunities that like for growth, but not putting this pressure on yourself to be anything other than what you are in that moment. Because you're in your Jesus years. And if, if the Bible don't have time to write about Jesus at 22 or 17, you best believe nobody has time to care really about what you're doing at 22 or 17. You're in your ministry working hours. So like get, you know, be about that business. Don't put that pressure on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, it's good advice. And, you know, when you meet people who are, you know, 18, 19 years old and they put all this just <laughs> pressure on themselves, because I have met people like that um, yeah. and give themselves ulcers because they mm-hmm. don't have it all figured out at that time, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, it's uh, tough. I was that person as well. Yeah. I was absolutely that person at 18, 19, 20, 20. I wish I would have took that advice. Right. You know. Absolutely. And with that being said, is there anything that you wish you had known that you know now besides that? Because that's a it's a it's a nice, I guess, uh, what's that word? I guess calming piece of information. But at yeah. the same time, like there's a lot of stuff I wish I had known when I was younger uh, yeah. that I know now. So I'm not trying to get you play devil's adv- advocate against no, yourself. But no, 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 I would say I guess it goes along with this. But like. I, I wish I would have known, and I still have to remind myself because I think this is still true. Everybody is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's dumb. Nobody okay. knows everything. Sure. Like you want to be confident, and and you know you want to be as confident. Everybody figuring it out. There's sure. nobody yeah. who knows everything. So like sure. the sooner you realize that your questions and your curiosity or whatever is just, or, or your confidence is just as important as the next person that you think has it together, the better off you'll be because we're all dumb and trying to figure it out. Right, <laughs> like yeah. we're, all of us are. Uh, yeah. You should put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> we're it's all dumb. Like, we all dumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. 100%. Man. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Very cool, man. Well, um, you know, I, I don't want to keep taking up more of your time, but, uh, I did have uh, one last question, uh, probably yeah, to wrap this up. What tips you have for people who want to be funnier, which is everybody, right? But they actually don't feel like they're funny. So, like, what what could they do to kind of work on themselves? Because you know, not everybody has natural talents, and a lot of comedians also, to some degree, don't have as much natural talent as much as uh work ethic so someone who's not confident in their abilities what would you tell them to become funnier i think funny is confident and i think confidence comes from knowing who you are and being well like grounded in something that you you know that you really know so like and when you know something if you really know something you're able to connect to people so like i always tell people i never i've never been the funniest person in my family like mm, ever really like oh god no my brother and sister have who, who are younger than me once did this like family draft of who's the funniest <laughs> and i got drafted like 16th like, <laughs> i wasn't even what in the top 10 and i looked at it and i was like that's absolutely 100 percent correct they, wow. they, I, they got me higher honestly than i should have been <laughs> if i'm being honest right because i think what happens is like there are some people who are naturally funnier right there are some people who right. just that's who they are and I don't, I would never, if even if somebody had that question, I wouldn't say, here's how you'd be funnier. I would say, how do you think you're not connecting with people? And a lot of times that comes with like not really being sure of who, what you want to present to people, right? One of the things for like young comics, it's not that they're not funny or they can't be funny when you start. It's like, you don't know how to connect to an audience. Mm-hmm. That's everything. How am I going to listen to anything you have to say if we're not connecting? So I always tell people, like, I never care if I'm the funniest person on the stage. I care about how deeply I'm able to connect with people, because if I can connect deeply, then we can joke like we best friends. And those jokes hit hard. Like, you ever notice how your jokes with your best friends are the hardest hitting jokes? Yeah. yeah, It's because y'all have a deep connection. 
So right. when I'm on stage, my you know, in a short amount of time that I'm able to be on stage, the goal isn't to be the funniest for me. Like, I know I can be funny, but the goal is to, like, how deeply can we connect so that we can have those best friend laughs as quickly as possible? So I would tell somebody that's trying to figure out how to be more funny or whatever, it's like, don't come up with the most clever joke or anything like that. Like, figure out how you can connect to the people around you in a way that provides the opportunity for you to have that that type of, you know, laugh together. Okay. So are you looking for, are you saying look for things that are, we all kind of experience and like universal things that we go through or? Nope. Not even that. I'm saying know who you are. Okay. Because that's attractive. And that, that attraction allows people to be comfortable enough to laugh about things. Because if you're, if you're going to be funny, you're going to be funny. If you're not, you're not. Like everybody's mm. not going to be funny. You know okay. what I mean? Sure. So it's like, don't, don't even put that pressure on yourself to be the, you might want, if you want to be, if you want to be a joke writer, that mm. technically you can do that, sure. right? But we're talking about being funny around people, man, mm. that starts with you. Okay. More than anything else, it starts with you. And then once people feel that, it's like, oh, okay, you can do anything. Cool. So I, you know, I observe things, write things down that you, that you think are funny. I would say lead with that. Mm-hmm. You know, that you actually think is funny and not what you think other people will think is funny. Mm. Uh, I remember hearing a podcast and it was one of the creators of Everybody Loves Raymond. Mm-hmm. And he talked about how uh, when they I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but like he talked mm-hmm. about when he wrote about uh, when he wrote the char- Raymond's mom's character. At first, he didn't think it would work. Right. Because it was so much like his mom. And he was ah. like, nobody's going to get this. <laughs> but what he found was that people were like, oh, my God, my mom is just like that. Mm -hmm. And he said what it Mm -hmm. taught him was the details, the specifics, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Cause people to connect to something and then laugh deeper or feel deeper about that character. And so that just, that taught me, and I remember listening to this podcast real early on, but it just taught me that like, oh, there's only one me. So why would I look outside of myself for what I think is funny? Because Mm -hmm. somebody, as a human being, somebody else has felt this. Mm -hmm. So just explore my own self. Like I, there's, like, we're all as deep as the ocean, man, as far as, like, our human experiences and how we feel about them. So it's like, explore that stuff, and you can connect with anybody, but you got to spend time in that ocean, you know, figuring it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's a, that's a great thing to end on, and a very positive, empowering thing to end on, because, uh, yeah, I mean, oftentimes, people don't feel... <laughs> I hope but I was good enough. solid for the kids, man. I heard you said there's younger people here. And I'm going to be real with you. I need young people to like me because I'm be honest. You ever be around a bunch of younger people? They're scary because they're so sharp. <laughs> and smart. So the last thing I want to do is like a bunch of like, I don't want to get a bunch of like 19, 20 years. Like, yo, this old dude is lame and inspirational. And next time I see him, I'm going to roast him. Like, that's my greatest nightmare. It's right, just a, right, right. a pack of a pack of uh, Gen Zers just being very upset with me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, th- I think you're good to go, man. You're, uh, you're Ooh. good to go, and you, uh, you brought a lot of uh, value and important information. So you're all good, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Well, um, the way that I like to finish out my uh, podcast interview uh, is I like to uh, kick a little, little freestyle rap, just kind of summarizing yes. um, the thing. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do. So here we go. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yo, he's the truest guy. David Perdue, do or die. That one dude that just comes through up on the stage doing his thing. That's what he does. Tells a bunch of jokes straight from his head. Not his notebook, but he records it. And that's what he does. A whole bunch of things that he brings. A whole bunch of laughter, new chapters, and the unity up in the community with his friends. Yo, he's looking through a lens of his people. That's how we do. I'm talking about this guy that got a bunch of jokes come through and he brings a bunch of hope, a whole bunch of good thoughts for the people. Just be yourself. Don't put yourself on the shelf. That's not the way that you got to go. You just got to roll and know that we are all dumb. We are just having a whole bunch of fun on the podcast with our friends, fourth and 10. And that's what I say. Yo, I just send a shout out to the other three. Yo, they are brotherly speaking to my people, keeping it down. It's who you are up on the inside. That's what I'm looking for when I look for the people I want to link with. And that's what I'm thinking. Spit a freestyle. Yo, I'm just winking at my guy because he just keeps going. Basically knowing it's all about growth. 
what it is you know from back in the day. We'll keep on expanding. Yo, he just landed up on the stage, up on his feet. And that's what I say when he comes through the street. David Perdue got a bunch of jokes and a whole bunch of things that are just deeper than the ocean. And that's how he's doing, not roasting by a bunch of kids. Opposite of that, when I drop raps, and that's what I say, straight up facts, spit off the top. That's how I'm going, that's what I say. The dude just showing a whole bunch of love, and that's how it goes, and that's what I said with a freestyle flow. Hey, I was very tempted to hop in. <laughs> yes. I was very tempted to hop in. <laughs> but outside of getting roasted by Gen Z, uh, uh, you know, I'm is is roasting is is uh not roasting. I mean, uh, you're freestyling. Yes, sir. Yeah. I've been beaten several times on road trips by people who I should not have lost to in freestyle battles. So <laughs> just no. leave it at that. There's Man. a lot of comedians that are like I I killed David in the car. <laughs> so I no. had to call. I had to call back. I had to pull back. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man. I've been I've been I've been beaten by somebody who. <laughs> Way back in, in the early days, who didn't even rap and he just had jokes on me. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, nah, dude, I've, I think we've all been there at some point. But, uh, dude, I'm, y'all should record some of those. That sounds like a whole lot of fun. Are you kidding me? It's like a, it should be a whole show, honestly. Like, I remember, I, I remember riding into like Savannah with like Rob Hayes and, yep. dude, and we just freestyling. And he's like, and he wasn't even, I knew he was going to beat me, but it was like other people in the car. And I was like, this is ridiculous. How am I the fifth best freestyler <laughs> in this car? Like this is, I did poetry as a kid. This makes no sense. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> hey yeah. man, it's uh, it's it's there to humble you. You can't be great at everything, okay? That's, That's true. <laughs> but I'm gonna try. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> no, yeah, you, you know, try and uh, at least uh, you know, have a good time uh, if you uh. If... That's true. You gotta have fun. You gotta have fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, dude, I, I'm so I'm so glad we got to connect, and you know, I'm I'm proud of you as a. As a fellow who's pursuing things and uh, seeing you do your thing is uh, is really awesome. So, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And and keep doing what you're doing, man. Because there's, there's growth on the other side. There's always growth. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Um, yeah. No, I, I I will take that from a guy who's dropped. Uh, what what are y'all at? How many podcast yeah. episodes? We're almost at three hundred. Oh think, my gosh! <laughs> I think we're almost at three hundred episodes. Like we saw a couple weeks ago, there was like a throwback. From like our first one, uh-huh. which was like four, maybe five years ago. So we did the math. And we were like, we should be close to three hundred real soon. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Are are y'all gonna do anything for the the three hundredth? Like, I think we have to. Now the the question is, when is it exactly? I think we're none of us are great at uh, keeping time. <laughs> I mean, as far as like you know dates, so we don't know exactly when it'll be. But we, mm-hmm. I think somebody said maybe around August. So yeah, I I fully we I think we plan on doing something. Yes, Definitely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, cuz that I feel that's like I feel like you should have get one of the Atlanta Hawks on just just to talk a little bit. Listen, we, I'm speaking that into existence right look, now. I called it cuz I've been wanting to get a Hawk. I've been wanting to get a professional Atlanta athlete on for years and I don't know what we need to do. But getting a Hawk on, I would I would love to get Solomon Hill. That's who I want. Okay. He All has right. the funniest tweets to me. Okay. You just find players' old tweets, old pictures, and just roast them. And <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> nice. I have to check that out now. Awesome. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Very cool. Well, Dave, thanks so much for your time. How can people connect with you on? Oh, by the way, Solomon Hill. You heard that, right? So. <laughs> yeah, Solomon Hill. You heard it here I, first. We want you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna slide this uh, into his DMs and yes. uh, and uh, see if uh, he he comes through. But um. <laughs> With that being said, obviously, 4th and 10 is the podcast. Yep, 4th um, uh, and 10 on Instagram and Twitter. I'm do or die. That's at D-U-E-O-R-D-I-E. And if it's come, if you're listening to this before June 12th, uh, myself and a good friend of mine, he's a rapper, poet, spoken word artist, a Don Bean. We have mm-hmm. created a show we call Double Consciousness. It's a comedy and poetry. It's incredible. We've done it a few times, but we'll be doing it in Athens, Georgia on June 12th. At the Morton Theater, uh, nice. so be on the lookout for that. Uh, it's honestly, it's my baby. Like I'm so proud of this show and what it can be and how impactful it is. And so mm-hmm. I really want people to check it out. It's called Double Conscience. It's myself and the Don Bean. I'm just trying not to get buried by a super dope artist. <laughs> He's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's quite talented, but you are quite talented too. Yeah, so. thank you. <laughs> yes, and <laughs> David yeah. is great. So <laughs> thank so. you. Indeed. All right, cool, man. Well, I'll make sure to tag all your socials in the uh, show notes and then a link to the tickets in the show notes. And uh, yeah, so people will be able to reach out to you. So very cool. Thanks so much, man. This was a blast. And uh, I'm so glad to have you on and uh, looking forward to just putting this out in the world. Dude, thank you for having me on, man. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. All right. Have a good day, man. You too, dude. All right. So that's the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot from it. And if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit follow so you don't miss future episodes. And if you are enjoying this podcast, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. That makes a big difference in getting quality guests and also in helping get the word out. All right, so that's all I got for now. Until next time, peace.